I hope that we can, can fulfill whatever wishes you had when you came. Uh, I'd like to take care of a couple of items of business before we really get started. First of all, uh, if you would please hold your questions until all of our presenters have uh, spoken. And then if you have questions and comments, we'll entertain those at that time. Hey, Tom, would you move you and the podium up a little bit so that you're not cut off by the light? Right here? No, just move the whole podium towards me. Yeah, yep, keep sure. coming. Right there, good. Right there? Yeah, now we're not cutting your face off. <laughs> okay. The second item of business, and I want to emphasize this to everyone, is that the committee that put the book together, Butte's Irish Heart, who says you can't go home, uh, is a nonprofit. We we applied for and received nonprofit status. Therefore, the the funds that we we garner from the sales of the book and hopefully some future sales are going to go to establishing signage, historical signage, to be placed in various uh, areas of the neighborhood at the at the start of the Anaconda Road and up on the old. Anaconda and Pacific tracks, uh, emphasizing where the buildings, the school, the church, and so on uh, uh, were located. That's the ultimate aim, and that's the next hurdle that the committee is going to uh, address. The committee itself is uh, a loosely knit group of Irishman. <laughs> I said the miracle of the, of the book and being here is the fact that we had 23 Irishmen working together for over a year and nobody got hurt. <laughs> to me, it was, was the real miracle of the whole endeavor. Um, but the, the the genesis of the of the of the idea became uh, a reality in late 2013. Two friends uh, from St. Mary's were walking along the old BAP tracks and uh, decided that maybe it might be fun if we kind of had a little bit of a reunion. So a committee was formed, and as I say, very loosely, people come in and move out of the committee and, uh, to, uh, to have a reunion in the summer of 2014. That reunion came about in, I believe, August. And uh, it was such a smashing success with over 500 and some people attending in the original yard and in the old St. Mary's <coughs> Church that several of us felt that at that time that we need to preserve what we've done here and therefore the book came about. We had amassed a, a, a huge amount of, uh, of photographs that were long buried in trunks and and basements of people's houses. Uh, also, we had done a number of <coughs> interviews, and we decided to catalog the pictures and then and then expand on the interviews. And there were several of us that uh, traveled really around the western part of Montana, uh, as well as in view, doing oral interviews and, and getting material for, for the work. Once that was accomplished, we, we sat down and began the real work of organizing the book. We, pick, we picked a uh, publisher, River Bend Publishing, in Helena, and uh, began to, to work back and forth with them, sending rough drafts, getting them back, uh, doing different uh, things in terms of structuring and so on. So on. And in April, I believe, of 2015, we sent our final rough draft to, to uh, Riverbend. We had planned on a, uh, another reunion in August, but things didn't work out quite the way we, we wanted them to. So we had our book launching uh, Sunday at the Elks, and it was just in time for Christmas, and it worked out rather nicely. And that brings us to our presentation today and uh, uh, the introduction of, of my speakers here. I, I was supposed to give you a, a brief background of uh, St. Mary's Parish. 
you know, as we all know, as denizens of Butte, that uh, Butte is Ireland's fifth pair or fifth uh, province. We all know that for a fact, and uh, I think we need to understand that St. Mary's is the heart and soul of the Irish community of Butte, and those people that grew up over I see in St. Pat's and so on uh, don't take. Embridge with me with that, but it, it certainly developed as as uh, as the heart and soul of, of the Irish community, and I believe the four factors uh, uh, contributed to that. The uh, with, with just a very cursory uh, 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 skimming of the surface of the, the area. These factors boil down to two individuals and two occurrences. The first being, of course, someone we all know, Marcus Daly, whose siren call to, to his countrymen to come to Butte and work in the mines with the lure of uh, high wages uh, brought them in droves. Not only from the old country, per se, but also <laughs> from the upper peninsula of Michigan, where my own grandma and grandpa had settled uh, after leaving Ireland and they, they came to Butte. So they has to be recognized as the father of the Irish community in Butte. The second personage that I think is, is really not well known, not well enough known, is the uh, Reverend F Michael J. Hanna. Father Hanna, himself a native of Limerick, Ireland, served as a, a, a uh, assistant at St. Mary's in 1906. He was appointed the, uh, uh, the pastor of the parish in 1912. And while he was there as, a, as an assistant, Hannah, Hannah really looked at the Irish community that eventually became St. Mary's uh, uh, and, and was, was disheartened, really disheartened in terms of what he saw. The poverty and the alcohol and things that, that weren't really pretty. The parish had been founded in 1903 and when Hannah got there, some people would refer to him as a rabid Irishman. He certainly wasn't a father figure in terms of cuddly father. <laughs> he was a taskmaster from the get-go. Uh, he whipped those Irishmen into shape, uh, sometimes not so very nicely. He, uh, but he was fiercely proud of his Irish ancestry, and uh, uh, he wanted that to be reflected in his parish. Gaelic was taught in the schools, even our generation uh, that came about in the 50s. Uh, we, we celebrated St. Patrick's Day much more so than we did Christmas or even <laughs> Easter or whatever. But uh, Hannah, Hannah, who's, by the way, uh, a wealth of his papers, his personal papers, are here on file at the Butte Archives. So, so we do have a window into, into the man's mind and soul uh, here in Butte. He, he uh, uh, would not, for example, baptize children at St. Mary's unless that child had what he considered to be a god darn good Celtic name. So we have, we have to, therefore we have, you know, a, a flora of, 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 of Michaels and James and, and, and Mickeys and, and so on, Patricks and so on. And that gave rise, of course, to the, 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 the uh, uh, preponderance of, of uh, nicknames. I mean, <laughs> If you had four or five Michaels in class, you had to have Mike somebody. So that, that was kind of an adjunct there. Hannah passed away in 1924, I believe, and is buried in, in uh, his home country in Ireland. I mentioned the two occurrences, both of them of which uh, uh, were in a negative sense in that the first being the 1931 fire that destroyed the original church on uh, North Wyoming Street, along with several other uh, buildings. It, the fire, I, I, as I researched the fire, 
it seems to me to reflect the real, the real heart and soul and intrepidity that, that, that the, the parish had. Remember, this is 1931, before Frank Roosevelt's New Deal kicked in, so economic conditions were, were, were really at the low point of the Great Depression. And uh, uh, the people of St. Mary's, they, they pool their resources, their meager savings, in many cases their insurance plans and so on, and chipped in and built a new church that still stands on, on, on North Main Street. My own dad and, and his brothers did that and uh, come up with the figure I was always told was $900, which was a king's ransom in those days, and purchased one of the stained glass windows that are in the church. The other, the other occurrence happened, and it went beyond anybody's ability to change, and that was the, the, the plan for what was called the Greater View Project in 1947. Greater Butte was a, uh, was a brainchild of, of Cornelius Kelly, whose love for Butte was probably, arguably, maybe only surpassed by his love for ACM. He was a protege, <laughs> of course, of, uh, of, of Marcus Daly. And uh, in an effort to extend the life of Butte as a copper-producing area, Kelly realized that he, he could no longer rely on deep level mining. It was too expensive. New discoveries in third world countries, open pit processes were, were carving in. And he, he devised a plan that was going to be open pit mining underground. The block caving uh, uh, of the, uh, 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 the Kelly mine. <coughs> It was a boom to view, but unfortunately, as with many plans, it didn't really reach its, its goal. When Kelly retired in 1955 and died in 1957, corporate bean counters in New York took over, and of course the Berkeley pit began in 1956, and uh, the devastation of view began. The devastation of St. Mary's Parish really began with the construction of the Kelly Shaft, which was, is right in the middle of the two main uh, neighborhoods, Corktown and, and Beverly Village. By 1989, the parish was no more, nor was ACM any longer, and mining had really come to a halt in June. Throughout its life, St. Mary's, ebbed and flowed with the vagrancies of, of the mining industry, as did everybody in Butte and every, every area of Butte. And today we have a number of people who grew up in those neighborhoods and would like to share some experiences with each of you. And again, let me ask you if you would, please hold your questions until everyone is done speaking. To start with, we have Diane Porter, who grew up on Main Street, North Main Street, and she would talk to us about the church, the building of the churches. And then following Diane, we'll have Danette, I believe you, Danette, Danette Harrington, who grew up in Corktown, or excuse me, slap me as soon as this is over, <laughs> who, grew up, who grew up in uh, uh, Dublin Gulch. And, 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 and Danette is one of those folks that proved long before Gloria Steinem and, and Bella Absolute uh, made, made uh, feminism popular. She was right there with those other guys up at the house doing whatever the boys could do, she could do better. <laughs> Following Danette and a, a, a resident for years and years on Anaconda Road, we'll have Jim, Jimmy Larry. Danny Kelly's going to give us some intricacies on Corktown, and Jim Harrington is going to fill us in on uh, the newest and, and what turned out to be the largest area of St. Mary's, Muckerville. So without further ado, let me please introduce our first speaker, 
Diana Porter. Much, much as those of us from St. Mary's uh, think where, where we are, uh, the most important, or at least the first parish, we were actually the fourth parish that was des designated in Butte. But St. Mary's has many appellations uh, applied to it. One of it is that it is a miners' parish, as uh, you all know in terms of the number of mines that were up on the hill and uh, our houses were congregated around those houses. Father Hannon, who was mentioned by Tom, wrote a history of St. Mary's Parish in 1917. If you think that we were a parish only since 1903, that's pretty good to have a history written about the parish at that time. But Father Hannon in that history said all but two families in that parish were involved in mining. So it was truly a miners' parish. It was also obviously an Irish parish because um, in, in Ireland, in, in uh, West Cork on the Barra Peninsula, are copper mines. So there used to be copper mines. So many of the uh, <laughs> miners from the Alhees mines uh, in Castle Tambert and Iris and their families uh, came out to Butte. So, um, they, they did come in droves from, from Ireland to our parish. And also, as is mentioned, uh, our first pastors of St. Mary's <coughs> Parish were Irish born. And as Tom said, they made sure that the uh, Gaelic language was taught in the schools. So, St. Mary's was also called the Parish of Widows. According to the uh, Museum of Mining publication, a half of those that were killed in the mines were Irish, either Irish born or of Irish descent. Uh, and that one, and that doesn't even count those that died of uh, the con, because I don't know if there's any records in terms of who died uh, from, from lung, lung disease. But also, there was a record that was kept of women who contributed to parish, ex parish expenses and this was in 1927, and of those women, 22% of them were widows. So it was a parish of widows. And it was also a parish of vocations. Um, there's a quote from Bishop Carroll uh, that's in the book. This is at the funeral of Father English, who was the first pastor of St. Mary's. And he told the parishioners, Make it the ambition of your lives, as if it was the ambition of your parents in Blessed Ireland, to educate at least one son to the Holy Priesthood. So there, <laughs> that came from the bishop. And uh, uh, Pat Carney, in his book on the Irish parishes, says that St. Mary's had the highest number of religious vocations of any parish west of the Mississippi. Now, I'm not sure. Where, where his source was. But nevertheless, in 1959, the diocese said that St. Mary's produced 25 priests, seven brothers, and over 30 sisters. And um, the, um, you know, and that was in 1959. So for a couple more decades, so probably were more, that came from St. Mary's Parish. Now, Tom alluded to our first church, which was built on North Wyoming Street, on the early morning of August 31st, 1931, a uh, house by the church caught fire. And it took the church, which was a wooden structure, uh, and about five houses um, along with it. And well, my aunt was one of those that was burned out. And she's quoted in the papers saying, regarding the loss of the church, she didn't talk about it. Or her loss of her house, she felt worse about the church. But that same day, Bishop Finnegan, I think it is, yeah, Finnegan, came down from Helena, met with local people, and made the announcement the same day that the church was going to be built, rebuilt. So John Ryan, who is known as an executive in the Anaconda Company, and also Montana Power, donated the land on North Main Street, which is where the church now stands. There was, um, there was a contractor, but as Tom mentioned, the uh, labor, most of the labor was done by the men of the parish. 
So from August 31st until December 20th, 1931, they do this <coughs> largely by volunteer labor. So that's three and a half months that they did that. That's it. They put that in. Yeah. This is the laying of the cornerstone. The paper said there were about 5,000 that, that were in attendance. You can't really see, but if you buy the book, it's on the cover of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can see the bishop there, and you can guess where the, the, the governor is, is also there. <coughs> what is interesting um, about the laying of the cornerstone is that Pat Carney also says <coughs> that it's very similar to the cornerstone in a cathedral in Ireland. I think it's the pronunciation might be Thurls in County Tipperary. And it's um, very, very similar, the, the cornerstone and also this tower here is very similar to that, that cathedral. And I thought, well, why, why would Pat be that? But as it turns out, that the cathedral that he was talking about is across the street from the seminary where our first three pastors were hmm. trained to be priests. And so, uh, and, and, it is, and it is very similar. So, so there is a connection even back to Ireland with the Lady of the Cornerstone of our church. So, but um, it, it took another year and a half before the church was completed. And so, um, and, uh, and uh, Bowen, I think in her recollections in her book, said that her class graduated from St. Mary's from the basement. And there were other activities over the next year and a half uh, before uh, the church was completed and it, a mass was celebrated in May of 1933. And interesting, I think for those of you who remember your mother's maybe devotion to Our Lady or our Mother Rachel Hill is that while the church was services were actually in the basement dur during that time, that um, the parish peti petitioned the bishop to have a shrine to Our Mother of Perpetual Hill, which he granted, and so that shrine was installed within the basement of the church. When the church was completed, that shrine was moved up to the main body of the church. Every Tuesday, for all of us who went to St. Mary's School, we went to the school, uh, or I mean to the, pair, to the church, and had a novena to our mother for perpetual health. And there were two more novenas each night uh, at, uh, uh, to our mother for perpetual health, which is very interesting in terms of, if you, if you can imagine what it, it looks like, it's a kind of a Byzantine icon which looks quite different from all the Catholic depictions of Mary. But uh, it caught on in, in the U.S. and of course, St. Mary's and another perpetual health. So that I think the women of our parish in particular had a special devotion to another perpetual health. Uh, and and uh, we even had novenas, maybe once a year, at least once a year, maybe twice a year, that went on for nine days too. That, that also continued perhaps that devotion. So St. Mary's, however, uh, populations moved, and eventually the schools, uh, I didn't talk about the schools, that's a, another talk, because we can talk a lot about the sisters uh, at the school. <laughs> but that's for, that, that's for another day. That's for another day. But nevertheless, St. Saint Lawrence and St. Mary's were condensed in 1967. Uh, they were renamed St. Raymond's, but that closed in 1969. The parishes, St. Lawrence and St. Mary's, were combined in 1978, and uh, eventually Saint they, they closed in 1986. So it's a, it was a passing of an era as a church. But the church now belongs to the Our Lady of the Rockies, and um, it actually is a venue for some of the folk festivals that are held, the supplemental folk festivals. But it was also the site for our reunion last year. So uh, St. Mary's still plays an active part in our lives, even if it's not any longer a concentrated church. Okay. Thank you so much, Di. Next we have 
from Dublin Gulch, <laughs> Janet Harrington. Please go. Well, I guess what I'm going to tell you about is what my most recent collection of memories, when you start doing these kind of a thing, you kind of go back and come up with all kinds of things you've totally forgotten about that I didn't put in the book. And, and one of the, I guess, unique things about growing up in the Gulch is that my whole world was the Gulch. You never left there until we were in high school to speak of you. Everything was there that you needed. We were there for uh, all day long. You went out and played. Only when you went to school or to church should you leave the neighborhood. Very few cars. My dad did have a car. The guy next door to us, Charlie Barton, had a car. Luxie Olson had a car. And the unique thing about the neighborhood was everybody did have a nickname. My father was called Dooney. My uncle was called Luck. I had an uncle Chick. I had an uncle Spickle. You know, didn't know what their names were like. Well, I didn't know that's what they were. And it was just, it was crazy. And then Plexi Olson, I didn't know Plexi had a real name. His name was Arthur, but his name was Plexi. We had Skuck Shea. We had Shimmy Cernich. We had uh, KB Daly. It was just amazing, the nicknames. And, and when I first ran for election, that was one of the things that we brought in was uh, my brother's suggestion was to do a card with nicknames out of that. And we probably put 90 on the back of the card and knew almost every one of them. My parents hung around the Bufuri. They went in the Bufuri. Everybody in there had a nickname. There was Chow Hanley and, and the whole group, Ears Holland, Porky Powers. And so I just never knew anybody by their name. It was always a nickname. My father was a hoisting engineer on the hill, and he worked 40-some years on the hill and uh, retired from there probably about 10, 12 years before he passed away. But it was amazing. During the winter time, he would never drive to work. He was a terrible driver. You just hated to see him go anywhere with him because he was an awful driver. And it was always up to get in the gulch and up to get out of the gulch. So no matter where you went, you were stuck, and the chains were breaking, and it was just shifting and clutching. And, oh, it was a nightmare. But we, he would drive occasionally. We went to, left the gulch, went to mass on Sunday, and uh, 9 o'clock mass. Never went home without going to Dugan's. Whether there was somebody there or not, they signed the book because they didn't want to have to sign the blind page just in case somebody died on day. <laughs> so we went to, every Sunday we went there. I think I was teethed on the kneeler in Dugan's. <laughs> but we were there forever. And he would he would walk back and forth to work and when it was really cold, he always wore a man's hat. And he had, you know, the Luggy ears, the good ears on him, you could see him coming around the corner. And so my mother used to use her nylon, silk nylon stockings, and she would make a little knot in the top of it, and he would pull it over his head, and he could wear his man's hat on top of the stocking cap to keep his ears from freezing. And then I can remember when she got the first electric line hook when he'd come home from work on afternoon shift, and he jumped in, and every night he'd jump and say, Oh, thank God for the Montana power. <laughs> he replaced that hot brick or water bottle in the bottom of the bed. <laughs> and my mom was always a homemaker. She had worked at the phone company uh, prior to getting married. So she was the busy lady around the house, and she cooked constantly, and she was always making cakes and cookies and cupcakes. Probably had cupcakes by the truckload. And everybody used to come on the weekends. My brother's friends would come to have a cake for them, and my friends would come to have a cupcake for them. And uh, so that's what she spent her life was doing that, walking downtown, doing uh, everyday walks downtown. And the people from the Elf Cab absolutely hated her because on these snowy, snowy days, she'd have bags of groceries. They could never get up the road. They would get partway, and then the little taxi driver was helping her lug groceries up to the house. <laughs> even make it up there. And then my dad would spend most of the winter cleaning the road. And he always had ashes that he would sprinkle on the road. And he'd shovel and sweep and then get down so we could get the car home. And then he would put the ashes and maybe some sand if he could find some of the truly ashes. And then as fast as he was cleaning the road, we were behind him, kicking the snow back on so we could slow right back <laughs> So it was a real, I guess, useless effort on his part, because we just loved the sleigh ride. And then lots of night, we'd, nights we'd be laying in bed, and, and you could hear the swishing coming down the road, and it would be a uh, kid by the name of an Alstein, George Lee, and Timmy Dennehy were skiing. They'd go up to Barry's house, 
and ski down there from Mary's house down our road into the bottom of the hill, and they would do that till like 2 o'clock in the morning. And they were the older kids, and he kept thinking, gosh, am I ever going to be old enough to ski at night? <laughs> we could only sleigh ride in the daytime. But, uh, but growing up was pretty amazing. Uh, I was six years younger than my brother, so everything in my young life involved my brother. And he was shot when he was nine years old. And uh, he didn't die. He lived to be just, well, in, he died in 2006. But he was shot in the neck, and they weren't sure where the bullet went, so they ended up taking him to the hospital. Couldn't find it, and after several hours, they thought, well, maybe it was a piece of rock that, that went through his neck. But they ended up finding that it had settled in his back, and so he lived most of all of his life with that bullet in his back. And he was really kind of a daredevil for always. He uh, tried to fly off of a shed with my mother's apron broke last fall ago. <laughs> he uh, just would never give up. He was always doing something. One Fourth of July, my mother had a, uh, the, what do you call it, the apron with your clothespins in it. So he took it and filled it with firecrackers. And then it had the X on the back. So he's on the backyard with the punk and he's busy lighting firecrackers and the punk dropped in the apron. <laughs> so my mother is chasing him through the yard, trying to undo the X on the back of the apron and all the cherry bombs and all the firecrackers. So it was always kind of a joke. We didn't know whether they'd ever be able to produce children after he gets With the apron on him, booming and banging on his, on his hips. <laughs> and then he got a J.C. Higgins, Higgins bike when we were young, and it was, oh, it was a beauty. It was from Sears, and it was black, and it had the chrome kind of a, a triple light on it. And he just loved it, so my mother said she liked to take it for a ride in the yard. So she makes a couple loops around the yard and lost her balance and crashed into the shed. I thought Harold was going to just cry. He was so devastated. The new bike looked like the garbage can lid before the first day was over. It was just an <laughs> But those are the things, and, and I used to uh, have a rock store up on the hill. We would, after I would go up and spend the whole day separating rocks that shine to make, you know, like jewelry sets. I thought I had a store. I was busy selling them all day. We cooked rhubarb next door. We uh, we never had to leave the, the neighborhood to have a good time. You were out all day. You were there from nine in the morning outside, just kind of killing time, you had to be home by nine. But it was a wonderful place to grow up. I was really lucky. The, the memories are just full of people and full of love. The neighbors all, the doors were always open. You could go to anybody's house. You never had to worry about not being welcome. They let you in, whether you were there for a meal or just to visit or a cup of tea. It was just a great place to grow up, and I feel very fortunate and very lucky. Thank you. Next we have a gentleman, Jim Larry, who's going to talk to us about life on the Anaconda Road. Uh, the Anaconda Road, as you know, served as a major artery to the Anaconda Workings up on the hill in downtown View. Uh, Jim is one of those displaced people that uh, felt the impact of the construction of the Kelly Shaft. And his original home was in the Gulch, and uh, they moved to the Anaconda Road later. So Jim shares memories from both both areas. Jim, please. Uh, I kind of like to start. Uh, my story kind of starts at the Dublin Gulch. Uh, my family. Uh, had a home at 7 Dugan Avenue. And the oldest child of uh, Dennis and Johanna O'Leary, whose name was Mary, and she was born in 1884. So the house had been built up there in around the 1880, early 1880s, 81, 82. And uh, my family lived there <coughs> until 1946 when they started to made the inroads in for the Kelly Mine. So my dad, was, who was the youngest of the 12 kids, he had no desire to leave St. Mary's Parish. So when they uh, came around to getting the facts about it, they looked at different places around the city. And uh, 
just couldn't find any place and he just didn't want to leave St. Mary's. And the house was a two-story house. So anyhow, they found the lot down on the Anaconda Road. And at that time, the Anaconda Company would, if you were interested in it, they'd move your house. So they took and they took the top half of the house and they moved it on down the road to 53 Anaconda Road and that's where it sat. And uh, I was about seven years old, I think, when they we finally moved into the house. And I lived there until I was 22 years old in 1964 when I got married. And uh, the Anaconda Road, like Tom said, it was the main artery going up to the mines. And uh, during the growing up years, you could always take and look, and we called it the 4.30 rush, because all the people that were working in the mines got off at 4.30, and you had a steady flow of traffic all the way down the hill until the, until the last of the cars went down. And uh, one of the things that was on the Anaconda Road, you had the Butte Mines machine shop, and the boiler shop, and uh, one of the things that the kids used to do is we used to go up to the mine shop, and they had the old uh, bearings up there. Well, we get the old bearings that were wore out, and we take them to Connie Denny. He was the, the welder over in the machine <coughs> shop, and Tommy had taken, cut the bearings in half, and we'd get the steelies out of them. So I can think he had a million dollars if he had steelies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that went on until later in the years, and then pretty soon that was all phased out. But you could always go up to the mines and they treated you royal. You could go in there for a nickel and get some pot. But then we, we go down and we start at the bottom of the Anaconda Road. Uh, the first people on the road, their name was McCoy. And uh, Father John McCoy was one of the sons. And uh, he became a priest. And uh, his brother lived there at, in the house after he did. And Jim worked for the Anaconda Company. And he raised his, his two sons. Or his daughter and his son, Jim and Janet. Uh, I kind of lost track of them, but I saw in the book that Janet had come for their, their, their reunion. But then you went up the road a little bit, and next door to them, you had the Madrazels. And, you know, they were Italians living on the Anaconda Road. <laughs> and uh, Concha, she was a really nice lady. And uh, they had uh, the two sons that I knew were Felix, who was really active in the KC's and Butch, radio, and he was uh, very intelligent, and he, uh, I first really got to know him when I worked for Safeway, and he, he was always singing. And uh, he went on to the School of Mines, and then later on went on, and he uh, ended up being an engineer. Next to him, you had the Crowleys. There was Jack and Delcy, and then there was Tim and Rose. And Jack and Delcy had two sons. Uh, John and Dan, and uh, we all played in the neighborhood. There was there was kids till hell wouldn't have it, you know. And uh, you could go up the road, and uh, you had people like the Matools that lived in the back, and there's Steve and Sis and Dodo. And then there was a lady that lived in back of them, and her name was Aggie Holmes, and her maiden name was Sullivan, and her aunt was the housekeeper when Lizzie Borden killed her parents. So that was her claim to fame. She was the housekeeper. <laughs> so anyhow, Aggie, God love her, the house was a two-story, two two-bedroom house. Aggie had 12 kids in that two-bedroom house. I mean, there, you'd go in there and there'd be kids literally sleeping in the drawers. <laughs> And as it would happen, I ended up being a godfather for six of them kids. <laughs> and thank God I never had to take care of them. <laughs> and then uh, we lived at 53 Anaconda Road, like I said, and uh, our house was uh, probably one of the few houses on the Anaconda Road that had a full basement in it. And uh, we would they moved the house down, and uh, they had to build another room onto the house so that the they made it into a three-bedroom home. Well, there was my mom and dad, my 
brother Mickey and my sister Mary Jo and myself, and we also, my grandfather, my mother's grandfather lived with us. And they were talking about nicknames. His name was Red Nose Riley. How <laughs> uh, we got the name Red Nose, I don't know. I got a suspicion. Uh, I think he kind of liked the Warren Corner a little bit. But we lived there, like I say, until, until, 19, until I did, until 1964. Uh, my dad passed away in 1962, and my mom and sister lived there until they moved out of there in 1971. Across the street from us, there was Jim Scow and his mom and Leanne and Rita. And uh, Jim is, was really active and interested in the way the, with the kids. I mean, he, he was a, a mainstay at the Washington School and taking care of the kids with football and baseball and track. And then later on, he was one of the founding uh, people that uh, found the Northwest Little League. And to this day, they got the scout field up on Cal Caledonia Street. Then, Across the street from them, and from our house at 52 Anaconda Road, there was the Rainovich house. And uh, there was George Rainovich, and his wife Kate, and his daughter Reen. But one of the ones that probably people know a lot more about was Zogo Bernus. Zogo was probably one of the best athletes in the city of Ute. And he was also probably one of the toughest. And uh, Zogo was always doing something. I can remember when I was a little kid, he'd go out and we'd kick the football around together. And you had, you went up and you had the Lynch house. And his was Ed and Mark Lynch, and uh, their bait was in tied in with the Bretts. And there was a priest from their family that was Father Brett. And one of the relatives and mainstays and relatives of them. Probably everybody knows him as Herbie Shannon. And uh, Herbie was kind of a free spirit, I guess you could call him. <laughs> but all the kids in the neighborhood, they would get together during the summertime. And they, you could see kids up there from 6 to 16. And we'd be up in the corner in front of Doherty's house. And we'd be playing hide and go seek, all and go rank, kick the can, anything you could do to get the kids together. And we all had a good time. There was no, no fighting to speak of, and uh, everybody got along fairly well. You could uh, go up the hill and there, of course, there was, there was Gene and Elmer Paul. El Elmer, was, uh, Elmer was a police officer, and he was uh, one of the first ones, I guess, who uh, took care of the fingerprinting. And he had the kids with Arlene and Dolores, and uh, Arlene married a guy that's probably one of the best liked guys in the city of Utah, that was Huey Welch. And you, we lost Huey a, a, a few years back, but what a hell of a guy he was. And then you went up into the, I'm just going to tell you the, uh, the people on the Anaconda Road that I knew. And there, you went up to the further low, and there was uh, two Sullivan sisters that lived there. Uh, I can't remember their names now. Carrie and Merle. Carrie and Merle, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, they, uh, they lived there until, gosh, I can't remember how long. And then there was the Pete Miller family. I can't remember them ever having any kids, but they were always nice and friendly people. And then you went up, and there was the Sullivan house. And you had John Sullivan, Al Sullivan, and there was Jerry, to married Jimmy Davis, and I own, married, uh, Coles, Frankie Coles. Oh, Frankie Coles, and Mike. And Mike and I went to school all together. We went together all through grade school and high school, and sadly we lost Mike a few years ago. And then there was Richie Holland and his family that lived next door. Any trouble I ever got into on the hill, Richie was right. <laughs> we were always getting in trouble. And if you went up the road a little bit more, then you were getting up into the area where the gulch was at. Then you had the Sullivans. The, the mother's name was Annie, and she, so everybody called her Red Annie Sullivan. And she had about four or five kids. And behind them, there was a house, and it was called the Callahans. And uh, there, 
Jack Flo ended up marrying, she was Dr. Gilboy's wife. And Jack became an engineer and moved away. And next to them was the Fergals. And one of the guys that I can say who probably helped me get in more trouble than anybody I can think of was Billy Fergal. <laughs> huh, Billy? <laughs> but, I'm not a very good speaker. I've never done this before. But the, as you went up the road, you know, the, the inside the Never Sweat Mine, there was uh, three houses. The bottom house belonged to Turgos. He was the, one of the mainstays of the Anaconda Company. And then they said there was a Nielsen house that was in there. And I don't remember that. Up in the last house was the McClone house. And Ed McClone was the head of the Anaconda Company in Butte, Montana. And we thought we were in seventh heaven when we got to go up into their house. I mean, it was a mansion. You could walk into the house. And I guess the first house I ever saw that had a curved, a curved stairway. And it was just, uh, it was just, a, you know, immaculate, big, really elaborate, you know, to be on the Anaconda Road. And you had the other kind of the families. You had the Kellys, and you had the Antoniches and the Johnsons, and it was, it was a really neat neighborhood to grow up in, and it was too bad that we did, when the Anaconda Company did start to build the Kelly Mine, because it, like you say, it destroyed the whole Anaconda Road. But I think that's about all I can say about it, but it was a great place to live and a great place to grow up. Thanks. As I was listening to Jim, it, you know, it became clear in my mind that yeah. how many people lived up there. And now you go up there today and there's, there's nothing. It's almost like a wasteland. Thanks, Jim. Next we have uh, the kid of the committee <laughs> and uh, the financial wizard, so I can't get on him too badly. <laughs> Dan, Dan Kelly's going to talk to us a bit about Cork Town and about the, the effort that resulted in the book. I know when you have this many speakers, uh, we, we run long because the problem or the blessing of this whole thing was everything led to more memories. When people were talking, uh, I know my dad talked, he was 10 years old when the church burned down and he spent the night on the roof putting out embers on their roof and there were kids on every roof on Wyoming Street putting out embers so that their house uh, didn't burn down. And when they talk about nicknames, I was always grateful that I never got one because <laughs> I never wanted to know what it was. St. <laughs> uh, Mary's was small when I went there, and there were three uh, three damn Kellys. Um, I, I'm going to shorten what I was going to say, but uh, just, um, you know, I, I saw a list of things you should do when you retire. One of the things you should do is write a book. I thought, yeah, fat chance. Uh, <laughs> And I don't know how, uh, I have a very small part in this book of people, Jim Harrington, Debbie Shea, uh, Lee Whitney, uh, Diana Porter, they've written other books. Uh, the other day I checked and we were 689,000 something on the Amazon bestseller list. <laughs> and last night I checked and we were 22,000 something. Wow. So I'm going, I think I'm checking this off my bucket list. <laughs> There's things that I've accomplished in my retirement, so we're going to call it good. I've learned things I never wanted to know about uh, writing a book. Um, it's, the writing is a small part of it. It's the, uh, all the other things and the layouts and the publishers. So I don't know how I got involved in this. I was a small player in the, in the reunion. And then I think through uh, just sheer numbers, they needed bodies. And I worked mostly on the Corktown section, Midge Winston, Midge Rivness, uh, Jimmy Winston, uh, Maureen Yellich, God love her. Um, and we would meet at Debbie Shea's house. And there were volumes of pictures. And here's how it worked. <laughs> We would have coffee, we would have tea, we would have treats, and we'd bring out the pictures. For every picture, Maureen Yelenich had a story, uh, would tell you who was related to whom, <laughs> what they did, and then Jimmy Winston would have us 
crying laughing because he had stories. <laughs> After a couple hours, Jimmy Winston would say to his sister, Bitch, I gotta go. We would go, leave the table a mess, and somehow, magically, it got sorted out after we left. <laughs> Some people had a vision for this book. I didn't. Uh, we were kind of independent of each other in many ways, the, the different neighborhoods. Um, and then it came time, they said, we need an introduction. And we were sitting there, and Maureen Yelnitz gave me the finger. I was writing the introduction to Corktown. Um, several years ago, I had to give a talk at a brunch, and uh, I it was a few days before, and I was in a complete panic, hoping for an appendectomy or a broken leg or something. <laughs> and Kathy Morris said, write about what you know, write about your neighborhood. And I sat down, and in a matter of hours, I was done, because those memories are so vivid. And that's really what I did in this case, wrote about what I knew and about our neighborhood and the, and the love that I had, that I have um, for that neighborhood, and the people that were there. I guess it was the people. Um, and then I read uh, Andy Antonovich's introduction to the Anaconda Road, and I, it was like you were going up the Anaconda Road and seeing each person, and I read Patty Lee's uh, introduction to uh, Corktown, and it's so well researched and uh, documented. And I looked at mine and I thought, oh my God, we're in trouble. <laughs> and, uh, so I gave it to Maureen Yelnich and I said, we got to change it. we got to do some things. And she gave it back to me and she said, I love it. It made me cry and that's what we're going with. So when, when Maureen said it, we were done. Um, I emailed it to Helen Maloney, Helen Mahoney now. I said, I need some help on this. And she sent it back. She said, no, that's what I wanted. So that's how we got. And just writing the book, I'll, I know we're in a... Crunch the time. The neat thing was we had a few rules, and one of the rules was you couldn't change something that other people wrote. It was their memory, it was their love for the neighborhood, it was their. Um, we had we had some things, you know, glaring grammatical mistakes, spelling mistakes, yes, but not not what they wrote. It was theirs. We had a few standards. Um, was it the Stewart mine with the T? Was it the Stewart mine with the D? Was it? Um, so we did have some of those, um, but uh, it was uh, it, it, it's such a you know, a treasure uh, to the people who worked on it, and, and there was much more than uh, the ones up here that uh, wrote it. I know I sat down on Easter Sunday when we were editing. I was planning on doing an hour or two a day. And I sat down the afternoon of Easter, and I was still there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the laughter would come, and the tears would come. Um, so um, I think, as people have seen the book, it's been well worth it. Um, I got an email from Helen Mahoney last night saying it was the best Christmas present uh, to the people of St. Mary's um, that we could ever have. So um, it's been an honor, and uh, I'll shorten that up. Thank you. <laughs> If you read the paper yesterday and saw the blurb on uh, the C-section of uh, uh, the newspaper, I think Dan's uh, uh, father, Terry, summed it up best when he was on his deathbed and said, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go back to court time. <laughs> 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 that really speaks for all of us. Uh, I remember when they were closing the church, I got into a bit of a verbal match with the bishop. And I said, we don't want this and we don't want that. What we want is our church back and you're not going to give it to us. So what are you here for? <laughs> but anyway, last but not least is uh, our speaker from Muckerville. Probably my oldest and one of my dearest friends. He claims we go back before BE Day. And he might very well be right. When I look in the mirror, I don't doubt him. <laughs> Jim Harrington is going to speak to Bob Buckingham. Well, thank God we're out of time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, was raised close to Tom up there on Woolman Street between Montana and Maine. And uh, 
the, we lived in the west side of the neighborhood. <laughs> and we'd always say we're from the west side, so that made us look really good, you know. But uh, Muckerville uh, extended from Buffalo Street down Maine over Copper and up Montana, and then included Boardman, Virginia, and behind the Goodwill. So it was a huge neighborhood. And uh, back in those days, we, who lived on Woman Street especially, looked at the uh, red. Uh, one by twelve fence of the uh, original mine. You know, it didn't have any grass in in the yard back then. You know, it was just uh, a lot of noise, and you couldn't see into it. And uh, as Tom says, I was raised uh, overlooking a mine yard, not the green of the seventeenth tee. <laughs> <laughs> I walked over ore dumps to school, or hitched rides on the B A and P. And we did. We'd hit. We'd hitch rides from the. Uh, tunnel up on Montana Street, uh, all the way over through the tunnel on uh, Main on, on uh, Main Street over to the uh, schoolyard on Wyoming Street. So that was a lot of fun. And you know, I guess it was, we, I centered uh, uh, my uh, writing of the book on the uh, time period in the 40s and early 50s when we grew up there, you know, and it, and it was entirely different neighborhood, and we, like uh, Danette was saying, you know, we, nobody had cars, few of us had telephones, uh, you know, of course, that was before TV, and, uh, you know, so we played a lot outside, and we, we had a lot, a lot of the kids in the neighborhood had a lot of ingenuity, uh, because there was no toys to play with, so we would find the old uh, wrecked uh, buggies and wagons and scooters and old pieces of two-by-four, and and rubber tires and stuff that were lying around there and uh, and make go-karts out of them and uh, we made rubber guns out of old uh, inner, tu inner tubes uh, for you younger people or what they used to put inside them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we cut strips up them, put a knot in the middle and, and stretch it along a, a uh, gun that we carved out of a two-by-four, a rifle sometimes, you know, that it shoot it probably about 50 yards. <laughs> and it, it, it sting when it hurt, you know, you got hit, you know, so it was a lot of, a lot of fun. And, you know, there was a lot of sticks and cans in the, in the uh, neighborhood, so we could play steal the sticks and kick the cans. And we, you know, I bought uh, one of the, a few of the, of the rocks that uh, Danette was selling. In, uh, in her, her neighborhood there, and I, she, I sold them last year, and they were pure gold. And I was able to, I was able to retire early, and I put them in the <laughs> cents well spent, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I uh, really did enjoy uh, getting involved in this book, and it got me, uh, you know, enthused about writing a book of my selected memoirs, you know, which I've also published this year, and so. It's, uh, it was a great experience working with all these people and seeing them in call again, and, it's great, and I want to thank all of you for showing up today, and I'll keep it pithy. <laughs> <laughs>